Take a little tub of water, bottle come to order. Mr. Phil and roll call, please. President Pearson. Present. Member Ferrer. Here. That's area. That's uh, Member Terrio. Here. The open meeting law reads as follows. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting to any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Mr. Ferlin, this item on the agenda, please. Uh, minutes of the previous meeting, so within your packet, uh, you had uh, minutes prepared by the staff. I reviewed them. Uh, any comments? Um, the chair would make a motion to accept the previous minutes. I'll make that. Place on file. Second. Motion to accept. Motion has been made and accepted and is unanimous. <clears throat> Mr. Ferland, next item, please. Uh, next, we have citizens' input. I don't see any citizens that are here present for input. Nope. <laughs> next item, please. Uh, the next item on the agenda, we have proposed leak abatements and denials. Uh, within your packet, you have a list of uh, leak abatements. Uh, the total uh, for this meeting for approved abatements uh, is $8,706.06. Um, <clears throat> there was one denial within the packet as well. At Primacare, they had a high back valve fail. Yeah, HVAC valve. So uh, some of those HVAC units, and this isn't the first time that we've had it with, the, there's been other places throughout the city yeah. that have had it. The cooling water, the valve sticks open, and it really, uh, you know, jumped their bill up significantly, as you can see. Consumption really leveled off after that, too. Yeah. Thank you. Is there a motion to accept the report as read? I'll make that motion on the uh, proposed debatements to accept. Second. Motion passes unanimous. <clears throat> the next item within your packet you have is a uh, settlement um, that has been prepared uh, with Borden Remington. I think as the board knows, in the previous meeting, I provided you a copy of the um, appeal that they applied for, and then they uh, applied uh, uh, to take us to the appellate tax court, uh, appellate tax board uh, in the state of Massachusetts, uh, feeling that the uh, the bill was uh, was um, unjust, and that they would do an appeal and were not issued an appeal. Um, through negotiations with them, we've uh, come up with a settlement agreement, as stated within the letter. Uh, this agreement, this this, uh, this amount will settle all past due uh, water bills on that property. We had a uh, meter that was on red from 2006 to 2020, um, and then, uh, then we read the meter and issued a bill. Um, so we... Uh, we feel that this settlement, I feel that this settlement is, uh, is within lines of, of what's due to, uh, of what's due to us, uh, and, uh, it will, uh, you know, forego any, uh, former act, uh, any future actions within, uh, in front of the appellate tax board. Any discussion or any motion? Mr. Mr. Brown, um, is, uh, the $12,000, that straight water? not to be portion, proportioned? Uh, that will be uh, proportioned water and sewer. It is water and sewer? Yes. Okay. Correct. It was for a water, it was for water meter and also sewer rate is applied to that meter. Okay. Is there a motion to accept the report as read? <coughs> Make a motion to accept the uh, report of the settlement of $12,000 as submitted by Mr. Furlong. Second. Motion is passed unanimously. Mr. Phil, on the next item on the agenda. Uh, the next item of the, on the agenda we have is uh, elections uh, for Office of the Watopa Water Board. Um, the, you all have a ballot for president of uh, 
the water board in front of you, and who will be taken today uh, by ballot as the charter states. If you would like to uh, make your votes, submit them to me, and then we can tally them up. Is there a particular one you would like us to use? Thank we have all. We have two. They should both be the same. One was in the packet. One was. Uh, yeah. One vote, vote for Robert Pearson, and one vote for James B. Terrio. Two votes for Number Terrio, two votes for Number Pearson. Oh, Terrio, excuse me, one can, vote one No, no, that would be effective the next meeting, um, Bob, I'm pretty sure. I think it's immediate. Uh, it says <coughs> the board chooses it, you know, if however you wish. So be it. There you are, sir. No. No, no. Thank you. Next item on the agenda <coughs> is on the fire lane gates and the hunter access program. So within your packets, you have um, a, a draft of the, what type of reservation policies and guidelines um, for allowing access uh, within certain parts of our land uh, for hunter vehicular access. Um, this, uh, this draft as laid out um, has specific guidelines in there. There will be three gates um, that the hunters can access. Uh, by special locks, they will be issued keys to those locks after an application procedure and, uh, and also uh, them agreeing to the rules and regulations that, uh, that we have uh, that we will put in place. Um, uh, the police department has, uh, has assured us that they're going to provide addition, uh, additional EPO support uh, within that area during these uh, time frames. The time frame will be uh, for the deer hunting season, uh, including bow hunting, primitive arms, uh, as well as uh, shotgun season, I believe. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not a hunter. So that I'm will not. take you from approximately the second week in October until December 31st. Yeah, <clears throat> correct. I believe it's... Uh, it's Right. There is a paraplegic week or a handicap, but that usually applies to Quabern and Blue Hills. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I think it's the 10th of October. Excellent. So the, uh, the hunter would have to have a valid uh, Massachusetts uh, state hunting license. Um, this would be for en entrance into the area um, uh, that's in between Blossom Road Indian Town Road and Yellow Hill Road. Um, we are keeping them away from some of the more sensitive wetland areas within this uh, within this uh, area. We'll probably end up uh, roping those lanes off. They need to stay on the designated fire lanes as shown on the plan. Uh, there are two lanes that they can go, one that goes straight, straight through the center and one that tees off. Uh, their access is to be used for hunting uh, purposes only and carrying out killed game animals. Um, they will be issued, uh, as I said, after an application process, they'll be issued a key, non-duplicatable. Non um, through the application process, we'll require that uh, they provide us a copy of the vehicle registration they'll be using to enter the, enter the area. Um, the, only that vehicle will be able to enter with them uh, in it, uh, so they won't be able to pass the key off to their off to uh, another another person to be able to use it within that area. Um, Michael Bossier will be the or uh, or designee will be the one that will be uh, meeting with and screening these uh, the hunters uh, 
for this access. Um, the uh, rules and regulations will have uh, a lot in there that they can't block access. Those lanes essentially are for emergency uh, vehicle access and uh, fire, ac fire apparatus access uh, to get into the woodlands areas. Um, so uh, they won't be able to block the lane. Uh, if anybody does violate our rules or regulations, uh, we have the ability to fine them up to $500 per an offense, mm -hmm. uh, as well as um, trespass them so that they will not be allowed back on our property. Um, so that's kind of the outlay of this. Attached to this, uh, to this guideline is a, uh, and a copy of any kill registration will have to be submitted to us within seven days. Um, attached to, uh, to this is also a copy of the 825-foot uh, uh, no-fire zone, which is ordinance within the city of Fall River. You can't fire within 825 feet of a, uh, of a residence, uh, as well as the uh, trails that, uh, that they'll, be able to, uh, they'll be able to access a map of the trails. This is a pilot program. It's set up as a, uh, a one-year pilot program. Uh, and will be reviewed at the end of the program. Um, so, you say that. reviewed. Reviewed by whom? Reviewed by us, and uh, I would recommend that uh, any future access, uh, or if this program wants to be extended, that it come back in front of the board for approval. I've struggled mightily with this. Um, I've spent a great deal of time thinking about it, and as a pilot program, I think what you've laid out is workable. There will have to be a limitation on the number of keys. And in the spirit with which this was first proposed was to assist older hunters, handicapped hunters. I'd like to propose that we retain, let's say 20% of the keys to be issued. For instance, if we're going to issue 25 keys, we ought to hold five back for people who are somehow compromised, if, uh, handicapped, accessible, wheelchair hunters. There are paraplegic hunters out there. In fact, I, I knew one, um, and he was a dedicated deer hunter, and he hunted out of his wheelchair. And I, 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 I think those guys deserve a shot um, of, over and above the rank and file. Um, we talked about this uh, today, um, Mr. Furlan and I did, and um, I, I think it, it is workable as long as the participants follow the rules, but it has to be made crystal clear to whomever receives one of these keys that they are literally on probation. For this type of a program, should it should anything occur, we can close it at any time. Um, for instance, if we ran into a fall situation with fire danger, uh, we may want to rethink having additional vehicles in, inside or off the Macadam roads. But I think your plan um, it's well put together. Um, the devil is always in the details, and um, I, I think, you know, we can give it a shot, take it as a pilot program for one year, um, but they've got to stay out of these environmentally sensitive areas, uh, especially around um, Blossom Lane, or Brightman Path, and uh, Brightman Path especially, and off the Corduroy. Hmm. Um, yeah, Brightman Path is one of the more Oh, that's so sensitive. Ones. And that's where the coke cut discharge pipe comes yeah. out, too. Yeah. So that's why it, it kind of bisects that area, but that's why we didn't allow that as one of the, as one of the lanes for them for their <coughs> use, just because yeah. of the sensitivity of that area. I was kind of surprised they didn't want to go over towards Doctor's Mill Pond because, quite frankly, there's not a large herd of deer left in the north of Tumba. Uh, but uh, be that as it may. Uh, yeah, this this has been uh, has been provided. A copy of this was provided to uh, the Department of Fish and Game. Uh, they did review it. Um, 
the original one, and they had a couple of minor comments, which uh, which should reflect within the one that's been provided to you within your packet. Well, the chair would entertain a motion on the draft reservation policies and guidelines for the Fire Lane Gate Hunter Access Pilot Project. Do we want to put stipulations? In? Yeah, if, if, if I if I may, um, I I think I share some of the same concerns and reservations um, in regards to the project as a or the pilot program as a whole. Uh, my question was going to be, do we have <coughs> or should we take this opportunity before we even approve the pilot program uh, to either put stipulation additional stipulations uh, in the in the language now or um, over the next. It does not necessarily have to be today. Is it something that the, the other board members would consider tabling for the next meeting and within now and the next couple of weeks, uh, or wh however much time we have before our next meeting, uh, add some additional stipulations, fine points in the language that, that would, while we have the opportunity. Yeah, you could do that. Or the other options would be potentially to put specific stipulations or, or amendments onto a motion. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to limit the number of keys, you could put that on a motion. If you wanted to uh, approve ru rules and regulations before they're issued, uh, if they wanted that to come back to the board uh, to, to mull out some of the finer details, um, or uh, you know, again, however the board decides, but that would be an option as well. Could we, um, could we take a vote to approve the the draft and revote in let's say a week or two we can do it remotely if you would like and have hash out the uh, Great the stipulations detail. and allow the members to of the board to to go over them um, and and you know, speak towards that. It, 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 the simpler, the better, um, because you don't want to come up with 100 rules and regulations, which is just going to make something fail. So we, we need to be clear, concise, and um, it's going to be a big enough shock when they find out about the 825 foot, which has been in effect, but now they will be seeing it for the first time. I would, and that's one of the stipulations. I would think that we would include a map of the area. We would include a rear view mirror hang tag with the key number on it, um, a copy of the vehicle registration. Um, it's not so important that we have a hunting license, but a copy of the vehicle registration <coughs> ensuring that the vehicle is insured. Um, Mass, valid Massachusetts driver's license. Um, that way, at least we we have that. Yes. I I just uh, see too many. It, it it's just an unbelievably sensitive area. That's all, you know. Uh, and I I don't think um, it it. I'm I'm very happy to see that it's a pilot program. Um, you know, and that in in a in a season we'll review um, whether it works or not. Uh, but um, if it were anywhere else, I don't think any of us would have half the reservations that we that we may. But um, introducing vehicular traffic and introducing an influx of people there for any given period of time yeah. uh, is is really um, I don't know puts us in a bit of a predicament. That's all. Well, if we look at it this way, we've got three groups of hunters. We have the archers, we have the shotgun hunters, and we have the primitives, or the muzzle-loading hunters. Um, I would think the archers are going to be less likely to use this type of a program. It's going to be more, more geared towards the gunners. Um, and I share your your feeling, I believe me when I tell you I've struggled with this one. This, this is, it is a highly, highly sensitive area. What would 
be, um, what is your pleasure as far as uh, a time frame to hammer out some further rules and regulations in and um, I can tell you the next couple of weeks for me are extremely busy, so to, uh, to get something uh, yeah. down within a, a week or two would, would be, would be uh, tough. Um, uh, you know, Mike Labossio will, uh, will play a big part in putting that together, um, but I believe by um, you know, probably the uh, first week in September we could have, uh, could have another meeting with rules and you know, proposed rules and regulations for the board to review and, and go over. How does that sound to the members? I'd make a motion to accept the program with stipulations till the second week of September. For the second week in September. That way, we will have time to sit down with Mike. I know. <clears throat> who, it, uh, not to change the subject, but who, um, who's going to be in charge of this? In charge of Mike? Uh, Mike Labossio will be uh, accepting the application. <coughs> Mike or, or a designee will be uh, <coughs> accepting the applications. Uh, reviewing the applications, making sure that uh, procedures uh, are followed. Mike has a presence out there, mm. as well as his staff, so they'll be do, doing daily checks during the week. Uh, I know that uh, EPOs, again, they've, uh, the uh, police chief has vowed to have daily patrols through this whole entire time of the EPA, EPOs in that area, um, and it's written in the MOU that they, uh, that they, will, that they will provide that. So. Mr. Pearson's motion gives us that time, I feel, to, um, to do this. It would signal, um, uh, with our vote tonight, it would signal that we're willing to move ahead, but we're cautiously going over um, the details and um, would, uh, the second week in September would be an excellent point in time to, in fact, take a final vote on the proposal. Um, could I, um, the chair would entertain a second on Mr. Pearson's motion. I will so, second Mr. Pearson's motion. So I just want to, um, so it was approval of the MOU with rules and regulations coming back uh, the second week in September for the board to deliberate on the rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I have the motion correct. Correct. Is that With the stipulation that no license be guaranteed till October. Okay. I believe we're saying right. Exactly. Yeah. Because the it, it, EPOs it, it will be graduating four more EPOs for us at the end of September, I believe. That's so what we've been told. So we'll so have in to other words, approve, the, approve oh, the pilot with uh, additions to come in the next four weeks, but no granting of any permits in, until such time, yeah. Yeah, nothing is permanent at this time, no, nothing whatsoever. The board would have ample opportunity to review um, the details and as, uh, as proposed. Okay. Um, a motion to accept us. I believe this matter is important enough, Mr. Phelan, to have a roll call vote on it. Okay. Uh, Member Pearson? Yes. For yes, uh, President Terrio. Yes. Okay, there's three yeses, no nays. The motion does pass. Next item on the agenda is the fiscal year 22 budget and proposed rate structure. Um, we have received from Mr. Furlan correspondence to the mayor going back in to the city council for an increase in the water rate and the reason for this I believe is that we've already lost a quarter of our fiscal 22 rate increase and therefore we've got to make up the revenue as we go forward. The council tabling 
the rate request has kind of put us in a bind as far as the necessary revenue to support the budget. And I don't see any other way of doing this except to go back in for a rate increase. They're not going to be very happy with it, but it has to be done. Mm -hmm. If you want, I can give you a, uh, a history of what happened this year with this year's budgets and rates. Um, I know it was at the uh, water board a while ago um, when we went through the original budget and the rate increases that were in front of you. Uh, the board approved. Uh, they were then submitted to the city council back in uh, May. Um, they were uh, the budget was given to the city council uh, as well as the rates. The rates were then in full council and referred to ordinance. Uh, they went to ordinance committee. Um, they were deliberated during the ordinance committee, which I was president, went down um, for the uh, rate discussions. Um, uh, and at that meeting, they tabled the rates, uh, both water and sewer, with an ordinance. Um, they had a uh, subsequent ordinance committee meeting, which those rates were on the agenda, uh, to be lifted from the table. They weren't lifted from the table um, at that meeting. And then there was a third one. Uh, we were, again, they weren't lifted from the table. Uh, in that time frame, the city then submitted its full budget um, to the city council. Uh, that includes our budget as well. Uh, we went through the budget process, and uh, the budgets were approved based on uh, Massachusetts general law, where if a budget is given to the council uh, and it's not acted on within 45 days, then that budget will be coming into effect uh, July 1st of the following fiscal year. So the uh, budgets were approved uh, by that uh, by that Massachusetts general law. That's also within the city charter as well. Um, but the rates were not approved at that time. Uh, they were taken out of ordinance. Uh, next ordinance committee meeting, they were taken out of ordinance, referred to full council with a uh, recommendation of leave to withdraw. Uh, they went into full council. Uh, a motion at that council meeting, a motion was made for a leave to withdraw of our rates from the full council. Uh, that motion did not pass. Um, so it required a subsequent motion uh, for the uh, item to stay active within the council. Uh, either a table, an object, a, uh, a motion to approve, or, or something else. Uh, there was no subsequent motion. Uh, they moved on to the next agenda items and then that meeting adjourns. Um, since there was no action by the council at that time, uh, that item is, uh, is, is gone. Uh, it's no longer within any committee or the full council. Um, so they didn't get their leave to withdraw, uh, vote approved, but by no action, essentially it was a leave to withdraw. Um, so it leaves us at a point where our budget is about $157,000 uh, in debt starting off day one. Um, so, uh, you know, and you know, the, you know, just for everybody's edification, the process to get rates approved is we have to take the rates, it comes to Water Board, Sewer Commission, uh, the rates go to um, full council, from full council, they have to go to ordinance, deliberated an ordinance. From ordinance, they have to go back to full council. That doesn't have to go back with a recommendation or anything, but it does have to go full council, ordinance, then full council. Uh, some of the other committees, something can go straight into committee. It doesn't have to go to full council first, uh, but that's how it works. Once it gets into full council, then it needs first reading and second reading and ordination, and then the actual ordinance starts 20 days after that point. So, even uh, next week is the next city council meeting, um, which we'd be able to uh, be in front of. So, by the time we go to next week's meeting, then there's not an, another meeting till September. If they have an ordinance committee in between that time frame, we could be back in full council for the first meeting in September. But then we need two readings, and so you would it wouldn't be till the end of September that you'd be able to. Uh, the rates would be enacted.
that's why on the revised ordinance that's in front of you for uh, water, I uh, uh, said that uh, the um, new rate would start at uh, October 1st, 2021. Uh, the rate has been increased uh, one cent from what was previously proposed to the bo to the board. Uh, that's for a uh, for the reason. Uh, give me the next slide. So, original rate proposed was three dollars and forty eight cents. Uh, that was a five cent increase from FY22 rates. The uh, current proposed rate that's in front of you for FY22 would be three dollars and forty nine cents. That's a six cent increase. So, uh, added one cent. You can go to the next slide, please. So this is just a breakdown of the FY22 rate increase. Um, the total rate increase, um, the original rate increase that was proposed added $157,265.66 to uh, our overall revenue in FY22. Uh, that breaks down to a little bit over $13,000 per month in revenue. We're missing the first quarter, so the first three months of revenue, that's about $39,000 in revenue that we're, that we're missing out on. Um, each penny on the rate is equal to about 31,000, almost just under 30, just under 32,000, a little over 31,000. Um, so what we would need, uh, since we're missing the whole entire first quarter, uh, is 1.26 cent uh, additional increase. Um, you know, we ran that down to one cent based on uh, all the calculations within the budget. Uh, that's where we come up with the six cent increase that's currently proposed in front of you. You know, it's a tough thing, and you know, I know the question is going to come up in front of council. Well, what's the impact to the average household? The impact to the average household is the same as it was prior. $10.78 for, yeah. for water, sewer, and stormwater. That's the average yearly increase because all of the residential customers were not increased on the first quarter. Mm -hmm. So the yearly increase impact to the average household stays the same. But, you know, the actual rate for the last three quarters would be higher by one cent. I like the slide with the breakdown, and I think that would be a, a useful inclusion to the council and put it right in front of. Yeah, without a doubt for, uh, you know, my hope is that, um, that uh, next week that they put the water and sewer rates on next week's uh, council agenda. Uh, at that point, I would hope that they would refer to finance where they can be deliberated at that time. Um, if, uh, you know, at that time, I'd, I'll probably be doing a PowerPoint presentation for the council as I have done in past years. Because um, at this point, it's, you know, the cuts that I explained, you know, two months ago to the council right now are more Im impactful because we haven't cut yet because you know the rate increase it, there hasn't been a definitive answer from the council on the rate increase they didn't want to leave to withdraw they took no action mm -hmm. so we need to be back in front of them having the discussion on how to move forward And just, just for the board's reference, sewer uh, is in the same exact boat. Yeah. Uh, sewer is uh, just about the same calculation, which is uh, one cent increase on the rate. One cent increase above what it was prior. So that is a eight cent increase in sewer and a one dollar increase still in storm water. We have no choice. We have no room to cut from what I've seen of the budget. We really, I mean, you can't run an enterprise fund without revenue, and you can't submit a budget that has been approved without a, 
a rate that will realize a, a, a budget that does not go into deficit. And that's the big that's the big fear that I would have. So just one thing that you talk you talked about cuts and, and what was uh, what was proposed prior for cuts if, if you would like I can go into uh, the impacts that were proposed if rates were not increased. Um, so uh, First recommendation that I would have of a cut would be uh, would be a discontinuation of fluoride within our water. Um, this year, the uh, the increase in fluoride uh, increased dramatically. Uh, we've have been having supply chain issues for a while, and we continue to have those. Uh, the price went up uh, from about forty thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars. What's the bid this year? Uh, so there was a drastic increase within that price. Um, you know, that's something that it's not a mandated chemical or a, uh, or a chemical that's required by any of our permits or any state or federal regulations. Uh, it's, a, it's one that's added as a, uh, as a benefit for our residents. Um, Mr. Phil, excuse me. Yes. Sir. That would be up for debate, I believe. I've talked to three dentists. Two believe there was no need for fluoride in our water. That's just from three different Could dentists. Could you say that again, sir? The increase in the fluoride, I talked to three different dentists, two of them didn't believe there was any need for fluoride in our water at all, because we've had it for so long yep. that they feel it's mm. topped out at its peak. I mean, if you were going to cut $100,000 or $60,000, there's a valuable savings. Yeah. If we find out we need it in three years, you add it. Yep. So just one thing on the fluoride, and we were, when we were having supply chain is, issues, I did research uh, what's needed to uh, discontinue fluoride within the water system. Um, to discontinue fluoride within the water system means DEP get their approval, uh, which they do grant, um, but uh, it would be uh, take a, a required a vote of this board. Um, but then also within the state regulations, it requires the approval of the Board of Health as well. So the Board of Health would also have to approve the discontinuation uh, of the fluoride within the water. I know they don't, you know, they don't control over what, what goes into our water, but uh, within the state regu regulations to mm -hmm. discontinue fluoride, it, it does have that requirement in there. Uh, I have talked to the Board of Health in the past when we had our supply chain issues. Um, they were, uh, they, they expressed, uh, they expressed their dislike and wanted to continue to add the fluoride within the water. Um, Is there any chance the Board of Health would pay for the fluoride? Um, you know, that is something that... Uh, uh, There's yeah. a chance, but it's little and none. It's probably a small <laughs> one, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, again, that's something that crossed my mind. You know, we do have equipment costs, we have an O&M cost, and everything related to the fluoride, <laughs> as well as the actual chemical cost. Um, you know, so... There's so no longer a fluoride reimbursement program. Uh, at one time, the city was reimbursed for fluoride. Uh, the Board of Health's budget yeah. is nowhere near what our budget is. Yeah, correct. They couldn't afford to take that on, I don't believe. Correct. I don't think they have. They, I can tell you probably in the FY22 budget, they do not have the funding Not, for not with what they've been through during COVID. <clears throat> so fluoride is one option. Uh, you know, but it, there, it, is, it is a process. Um, reduction of overhead costs to the city, uh, as probably most of the board knows and see so within the budget. We pay about $1.3 in indirect costs back to the city for services uh, that the city provides to uh, the water department. Um, the problem with the reduction of $160,000 in our indirect costs uh, uh, to the city, a would be uh, reduced services from the, the city uh, to the water department. And when I say services, it's it's services like uh, uh, collections. They do all of our uh, collections within the department. Uh, administrative services, uh, financial services, auditor's office, treasurer's department. Uh, the city does all of our bonding for us. Additional support from the mayor's office, law department, engineering. Um, but if we were to cut indirect costs that's paid back to the city, 
then the city essentially has to make up the hundred and sixty thousand dollars somewhere within their budget uh, reduction of water capital uh, we were carrying two hundred thousand dollars within this year's water capital um, but that uh, that included uh, replacement of our service truck which is on the road of you know five six days a week um, when we're in overtime and you know is uh, is a uh, kind of like a Swiss Army knife that the guys need to have uh, that truck is uh, uh, is starting to show you know where uh, in an increased service cost uh, we won't be getting rid of the old truck but we will uh, we will be having uh, two service trucks at that point uh, the other thing is for OSHA equipment and training uh, within that there's, there's other things uh, that are within that capital but capital could be reduced um, cuts if there was so if there was no in rate increase uh, the other the last thing really that I see to cut within the whole time budget would be uh, labor you know, we, we have a fixed cost our fixed costs are phenomenal you know debt service we have to pay our debt service mm -hmm. electricity we need to keep the lights on and the pumps going um, you know uh, we're left with very few variables within our budgets. Given the choice, I agree with Mr. Pearson. Um, most toothpaste today contains fluoride. If you, your kids get fluoride treatments uh, in with their dentists and periodontists. And you're getting them in school. Hmm. Um, I, I think the first thing to go would have to be something that is not a mandated chemical it's not a health issue it doesn't improve the quality or the taste of the water it has nothing to do with um, the safety of the drinking water so that would be my first choice hmm. given if the council does not approve a rate increase and i would be I would be in agreement that that should be, uh, well, maybe we should hold that to ourselves. Because we would have to make the cuts in the budget. So. It's still only a portion of, of the lost revenue. Today. Small portion, yeah. too. It's yeah. really, even, even, if it were the, even if it were a complete $60,000 savings, uh, it's, it's still, still slightly less than, a th slightly more than a third of what we're missing mm. so it, it unfortunately it isn't the only answer yeah. correct well chair would entertain a motion to um, present the city council with the letter that mr Furlan has on the proposed rate increase to three dollars and 49 cents yes yes i believe that's going to require a vote mr Furlan, by the board Roll call on that motion, please. I would make a, we don't have a motion yet. I would make the motion. Yeah. <clears throat> motion, uh, second the motion. Okay. Uh, Member Ferrer? Yes. Member Pearson? No. <clears throat> uh, Member Terrio? Yes. Two to one, the motion passes. Item number eight, other potential matters. Is there anything further to come before the board? Yes, there is. What is that, sir? Uh, this past Sunday, City Council Trot Lee and I took a walk through the reservation looking at various projects that have been ongoing for, seems like forever. However, just to keep him updated, and I've done it with most of the city councils with the exception of two, I believe, at this time. Uh, and they're always happy to find out what is or isn't going on. So at the next council meeting, there'll be a resolution by Council Lee to investigate why the roads have not been repaired. It's got nothing to do with the water, mm -hmm. but it has in an abstract way because Right now, the road from Wilson Road to the reservation headquarters, meaning Blossom Road, is impassable for any fire, rescue, uh, 
In fact, a lot of our trucks have a hard time getting through there. My car bottoms up. Uh, I've seen people having to be pulled and pushed out of some of these potholes, and you can't tell how deep it is after it's rained. So for safety's sake, I'm not sure which uh, committee Council Lee is going to be sending it to. He's drafting a proposal. It'll be ready for the next city council meeting. I do this just to keep you informed, and that's where it stands at this moment. That's all I have. So just on the roads out there on the reservation, if I can say a couple of things. Uh, as the board members know, just for everybody's edification, all those roads within the reservation are all Chapter 90 uh, roads. They fall underneath the uh, jurisdiction of the DCM, Department of Community Maintenance. Uh, they all are eligible for Chapter 90 paving uh, funding. Uh, to be used on those roadways um, but uh, the one thing that we do have to remember uh, is the type of treatments that they do use out there and uh, you know all any and all treatments that are done typically by engineering are usually uh, reviewed by uh, by this department to make sure that uh, we concur with their treatments out there just because of the sensitive nature of all of the runoff that comes off those roadways and go potentially end up in the pond so uh, we just like to make sure that uh, the treatments that are done, done out there are proper for those roadways. So. I did, if I might, uh, I did further explain exactly that to Council Lee and most of the city councils that I have ha ever had out there. That You see a state project going on on the highway, they always use these, it looks like a sauna tube, but it's not. It's a buffer tube that rolls out, and I'm sure Mr. Phil is aware of it. And it's temporary at best. It's You're talking keep, about millings? Right. Yeah. It's to keep not only litter, anything uh, that could flow into the water supply. Of course, most of the highway water runs into the new uh, viaduct that we have just had cleaned out. But over on the east side of the pond, as we call it, that water could run directly to our drinking supply. However, some of our uh, tubes that run under some of the laneways need to be cleaned. We only have three people working out there. To do this correctly, you probably need six, seven, or eight people, as they did back in the 60s and 70s, which I'm sure you might remember. But we I don't have I remember 110 them. employees. Yeah, well, uh, you know, the old days we used to burn trash under the pine trees out there, too. You can't do that anymore. But something needs to be done for the roadways out there, because this is uh, Mr. Perry's Bailey Wick, if you will. However, he has told me in the past that we we're going to have conversations and phone calls have gone by the wayside. However, uh, Mr. Perry's a good man. He does a good job. He coordinates a lot of things with Mr. Furlan, Mr. Labasia, and Mr. Ty, for that matter. But we are at the point, I counted them today, there are 162 houses in our reservation area. And this being a political season, there are at least two votes in every house, so the city council has to look at this. Just because it's an election year? No, because of the safety of the public. And because of our vehicles are taking a beating. To, to get to Wilson Road to pick up trash, now, I might notify Mike Labas here on a weekend. I leave him a message. Mike, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, there's trash at interlocking gate on Wilson Road. Well, that doesn't get taken care of until Monday, maybe Tuesday if Monday's a holiday. And usually it does get taken care of, to my satisfaction at least. I'm sure the other commissioners can tell you the same stories. But on weekends and at night, people unloading refrigerators, stoves, tires, especially tires, because if you take them in a tire shop, they're gonna charge you at least two to four dollars to get rid of them. Uh, it's obnoxious the way people are treating our woodland out there. And they're traveling over those bad roads that I just told you about. I hope they all lose their mufflers in the process. Uh, I know I've come close to losing a muffler or two. But that is what's going to happen at the next council meeting. Uh, I did help Trot Lee, or Council Lee, draft this resolution because he's still working on it. But that is what's going to come before the city council in the near future. So I bring that to your uh, edification. Any idea of what that would cost? 
No. So repaving the roadways out there, I believe there was a study that was done uh, as part of our integrated plan. I believe we were right in the 35 to $40 million range to repave all the roadways out there. That's with blacktop, sand, Correct. gravel. There's a lot of other things you could do. The problem is washout, but well, a road grader can correct a lot of that problem. Yes and no. So depending on the funding that's used, Chapter 90 funding has minimum requirements for roadway treatments. Um, so you couldn't just uh, use Chapter 90 funding to do uh, subsurface repairs. All, all of their... Uh, all that funding needs to be DOT approved treatments that are done to the roadway. Um, you know, uh, any filling of potholes or anything with any type of material out there, uh, and I've had this discussion with uh, DCM before, I recommend a clean stone fill um, coming from a quarry, uh, not anything that has any type of uh, uh, a tar or asphalt base mm -hmm. or uh, millings or something like that. Um, you know, because the problem is, um, you know, you're going to put it in the hole, uh, the hole's going to get water again, and eventually, after years of cars driving through it, they're going to squish it out and push it out, and it's going to be all in the embankments and then running down uh, down the wetland areas. Uh, that's why I've always recommended a clean stone fill from a, from a quarry base, essentially something that, uh, something that, doesn't, that, if it does get washed out, it is natural and will not uh, impact the environment. So It'd be easier to maintain than blacktop, yeah. health-wise. I mean, blacktop is not good for our water. Uh, however, even if we put those tubes after the blacktop is down, you have to surround it with these tubes. I don't know what the lifespan of that is, but, uh, but having passable roads out there is very important to the neighbors. Right now, we're losing revenue because people are going to BJ's rather than take the shortcut up Wilson Road to Shores or any of the smaller markets in the city. So we want to keep raising taxes and rates, but it doesn't seem like, you know, and the other argument, by the way, is that, hey, I live on Hall Street or Summit Street, whatever. I want my street done too, you know. <laughs> I understand that. I understand that. And Mr. Perry is well aware of that, of course. And I don't live on either one of those streets. Yeah, the, you know, and, and just for DCM, there is uh, you know, as I put in, actually I found it out today, two, 273 miles of Chapter 90 roadways within the city of Fall River. Uh, so, um, you know, and I know the cost uh, to pave roadways is extremely high. We do get Chapter 90 funding from the state every year. Um, you know, I remember probably five years ago they were getting about $2.2 million. I think now they're down to about $1.9 million per year that they're receiving. Uh, and you know, Isn't uh, that the it's, you know, I know it's always a battle within DCM and the engineering department of um, you know inner city streets or high traffic streets and um, streets within the reservation. They have done uh, they have done three areas out there that I'm sure the board is aware of. Within probably the past four years, I think uh, it's been uh, one of the areas from some of the quarries on the north is taken the uh, is taken a toll. Um, uh, the uh, national grid did do some uh, did do some improvements on Bell Rock Road, uh, so that they could uh, do work at their substation. Uh, so, but yeah, you know, would would we? Uh, I think would everybody love to be able to say, yep, let's take uh, chapter ninety money next year and go <coughs> pay, go pay four or five miles of roads out on the reservation. I think uh, everybody would love to do that, but uh, as you just said. Um, Member Pierce in this, uh, that you wouldn't be able to do any inner city streets. So, well, like I say, I think the easiest solution is gravel and or sand, which is a floatable substance. However, if the DPW doesn't have the ability to get out there with a road grader and finally grade it the way it should be, by that I mean a road, you know, a rough road like we have in the reservation, should have a high point and a low point so water would run off. Right now it's all flat road out there, except those depressions in the ground. Those roads have never been treated the way they should be because they weren't high traffic roads. But now we got, you know, I counted 164 houses, I believe. You know, we're putting population out there. So that's why I brought it to 
Council leaves it. DPW would meeting. like to fix them. I'd be the first one to cheer them on. Well, he, he was somewhat upset when he saw it because he thought the roads were being repaired. And the no. only road that's been repaired is from Yellow Hill uh, to Indian Town, where there's a fire tower, and that's the reason why we, we they also shared the cost of fixing that road. I believe it's the FBI, the sheriff, and, and different organizations because they use that fire tower. However, it's not enough for the people who live out there. There's only two houses on that section of the road. And once you get to the first house, the roads are no longer paved well enough. And by the way, the people who live out there do most of the snow plowing. It's not done by DPW. I give that to you for your ratification. All right, any other further else. business to come before the board? Hearing none. I make a motion to adjourn. I second the motion. Voted unanimously to approve. Meeting adjourned at 8.04. Thank you very much.